six on the Forbes list in 2017 if you need to take a call, please step out to the hallway so the meeting is not disrupted. The public hearing on item number one is hereby opened. Yeah, approval of the September 21st Zoning Board of Adjustment meeting minutes. Move to approve. Second. Galen made the motion to approve. Karen seconded. Further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Item number two. Item number two is 17 VA 010, a variance request to reduce the minimum required rear yard setback from five feet to one and a half feet for a property located at 2410 Harney Drive. Property is zoned low density residential district as are properties to the east, west, and south, and property north is Park Forest District. Uh, there's currently a single family dwelling and a detached garage located on the property. Uh, properties to the south, east, and west are also constructed with uh, single family dwellings. Property to the north is uh, the cemetery. Uh, future land use is low density neighborhood. And here we have uh, just east of Sheridan Lake Road, which is identified as a principal arterial street. Uh, site plan shows that uh, the rear yard setback is currently 1.7 feet. Uh, in 1998, a building permit was issued for this detached garage showing a five foot rear yard setback. Uh, it was constructed in the wrong place, uh, but at that time, it appeared that it was in the right place, but after surveying it recently, it, it shows that it's only a 1.7 foot setback. The request of 1.5 feet is to make sure that it's still not off. It's, it's close enough to that 1.7, 1.5. Uh, the applicant has also vacated the uh, utility and minor drainage easement which uh, the garage encroached into, as well as a note on a plat which identified the setbacks. Uh, there was also another uh, encroachment which was 7.9 feet into the eight foot side yard on this side, which was uh, approved through a zoning exception, which is an administrative review. The garage is existing. The applicant has vacated the 
easements in which the garage encroaches. Uh, here is a view of the property to yesterday or the day before showing uh, the front properties for sale. Uh, that garage which is located to the north of the house where it's located. They're not proposing to expand it. They're just trying to bring the existing garage into compliance. Uh, west along Harney to the east along Harney. The house directly to the south. Uh, staff is recommending that the variance request be approved for the existing garage. Uh, however, if the garage is removed or destroyed beyond 50% of its value, then uh, a new structure would have to be built back with a five foot rear yard setback per the zoning ordinance or whatever the zoning ordinance says at the time. So uh, staff's recommendation is to approve for the existing garage. Are there any questions for staff at this time? I don't see any. Uh... Janelle, is this speaker request for the Planning Commission item two or this item? Okay. Would you like to come up and say a few words? Good morning. My name is Janelle Fink. I'm with Fisk Land Surveying, and I'm here on behalf of um, Sharon and David Bradley. Um, David is her son, but Sharon and her husband are in the audience here today. Um, we appreciate staff's review and consideration of this. This particular case is just a, a misunderstanding as to where the actual property line was. There is a chain link fence five feet north of the existing garage that runs easterly and the assumption was that that was where the property line is but as we often see fences are not always on property lines. Additionally there's a large overhead power line just north of the fence and that also tends for some people to lend credence thinking that utility lines are, are on the property lines which again is not always the case. They built believing that they met the setback requirement and were more than surprised when they had a recent survey and discovered that that was not the case. So uh, we appreciate staff's consideration of the misunderstanding and uh, request your approval of the variance. Thank you. Uh, Galen. Sure. So, <coughs> excuse me. I'll make a motion to approve this, uh, approve this variance. I know we need to make a, uh, have some criteria that we cite here. So I'll use number two. It's the, this is the minimum adjustment that we need for the reasonable use of this land. Uh, Mike second that motion from Galen to approve the variance uh, from five feet rear yard setback to 1.5 feet based on item number two that this is the minimum adjustment needed for reasonable use of this land. Is there further discussion on the motion? Um, Mr. Chair? Yes, Fletcher. Uh, were you going to go with staff's recommendation for the existing structure, but any new structure would be required to have the five foot rear yard setback or just? Okay. okay. Thank you. Both the motion maker and the second concurred with that. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I move to close the Zoning Board of Adjustment. Karen made the motion to adjourn the Zoning Board of Adjustment meeting, and Rachel seconded that motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We will now commence the Rapid City Planning Commission meeting for November 9th, 2017. Again, if any member of the audience wishes to speak to one of these items, please fill out a speaker request form uh, on the table on the left wall and hand it to the secretary. Please fill it out with the agenda number of the item you wish to speak to. Move to the consent calendar. Item number one has been placed on the consent calendar and may be approved by a single vote. The item may be removed from the consent calendar by any planning commissioner, staff member, or audience member for separate consideration at this time. 
Would staff, anybody on the Planning Commission or any audience member like to remove item one? Move it to Okay, Karen made the motion to approve the consent calendar and Mike seconded that motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number two. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item number two is an ordinance amendment to Chapter 17 to allow artisan distillers as a conditional use in the general commercial district and the central business district. And artisan distillers, uh, by definition, an artisan is a, a craftsman, and the distiller portion of it is creating a product that we would know as hard liquor. In the past, you may recall that the city has uh, amended their ordinance to allow microbreweries and farm wineries as conditional uses in the central business district and the general commercial district. At that time, uh, Planning Commission reminded us that this may be something that we should be looking at, that other communities were allowing the artisan distillers in these same environments. Uh, it does bring tourists in, it brings locals in, and they're small in nature. Uh, we did get an application from Randall Decker, who's sitting in the audience today. He currently has an artisan distiller in Box Elder. Um, he came in and sat down with me and actually walked me through how this process works. It's uh, very interesting. What they would like to do is, if this ordinance amendment does get passed, is relocate to Rapid City. Um, we've looked at it from the perspective of, is it appropriate in these two zoning districts? As you note, that in both the general commercial district and the central business district, these kinds of recreational eating and drinking establishments have been identified by the Planning Commission and the City Council as the areas that are appropriate for this use. South Dakota codified law identifies and regulates the artisan distillers. They license them. It uh, allows through the license that they're both be on sale and off sale and it limits the production to not exceed 50,000 gallons in a calendar year. And 30% of that product must come from South Dakota. So looking at this, when we bring these forward as a conditional use, during our review, not only will we bring forward the criteria for a conditional use, but also for the on-sale liquor use to ensure that it's located correctly within those two districts. That being said, our recommendation is to approve the ordinance amendment, and it will basically read in both of these two districts, artisan distillers operated in compliance with South Dakota codified law, including chapter 3513. And the reason we didn't spell out any particulars within our ordinance is so that if South Dakota codified law should amend their regulations, we don't have to come back and do an amendment to ours. And our recommendation would be to approve. Any questions for me? And Randy is here to answer questions too. Thank you, Vicki. Karen? Vicki, thank, thank you. Uh, I do have a, a quick question. Will this allow them to have like sample tasting and that kind of stuff? The South Dakota license does allow for sampling. Okay. I, I, I have been to other communities where they have this in their downtown and it's always an attraction. You know, people like to go there and they have a lot of times they have fancy bottles and you know different things that go with it and it, it it's it's a i think it's a good idea and it's going to bring you know more excitement to the downtown just because of the tourists and the natives kind of going in there to look at it and stuff so people from rapid city would enjoy it i think so i support it thanks further questions or discussions anyone else Rachel made the motion to approve the ordinance amendment to allow artisan distillers as a, as a conditional use in the central business and general commercial districts. Second. Galen seconded the motion. Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Item number three. Good morning, Sarah Hansel, Long Range Planning Division. Item number three is a request to rezone property from no use district to medium density residential district. This application has been withdrawn by the applicant and was resubmitted. 
So it will come back to the Planning Commission as a, as a new application. Um, so staff would recommend that the request to withdraw this application be acknowledged this morning. So Galen made the motion to acknowledge the withdrawal of this item. Yeah. Mike Kwasney seconded that motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number four. Item number four is a request to rezone property from no use district to office commercial district. It is for the property adjacent to item number three. With the new application coming forward, the applicant has requested that item number four be continued to the November 22nd um, planning commission meeting and staff would recommend that it be continued. Karen made the motion to continue item number four to November 22nd. Galen seconded that motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number five. Good morning. Patsy Horton, Long Range Planning. The item before you today is uh, two resolutions, one to create a tax increment district and the other is to approve the associated project plan. The proposal for the uh, new district is located at the northwest quadrant of 16 and uh, Catron Boulevard. A lot of people know it as Mount Rushmore Road since we've just recently changed the name of Highway 16 from Tower Road South to Catron. So now officially it's Mount Rushmore Road, but a lot of people still think of it as Highway 16. Some uh, basic information on um, what a tax increment district does and how um, it works. The first thing that we look at is the base valuation to create a district. So in this little portion of the graphic, that is um, what's called the base valuation. That's the property value of um, the property when the district is created. We estimate the valuation um, today at three, just over $3 million. That does not include, um, actually that takes into account the removal of uh, the cart ranch that used to be there. And so what happens from that is in this little box here, all of these taxes are still generated and forwarded to um, the taxing agencies. So down here on the side you can see the value of that um, base valuation and the taxes that are still being directed to the school district, the water district, the city of Rapid City and Pennington County. So with the new district, what that does is anything over and above, uh, any tax revenue that's generated over and above that base valuation, that's called the tax increment. That's in this little box here. So generally after the district is created, development occurs, um, structures are constructed, and um, the increase in the revenue is called the increment and that is then directed to whatever is approved in the project plan. Today we estimate, excuse me, um, the revenue by 2020 to be at um, 264,000. And what happens um, with the revenue is the structures constructed, um, for example, in 2018, the taxes are assessed in 2019 and they're paid in 2020. So anything within the next year um, we estimate it's going to be a $264,000 increase in the revenues. So one of the things that um, state law requires us to look at is um, either blight finding or economic development. Um, the blight is referenced at 25% of the real property or not more than uh, at least 50% of the property is going to generate economic um, revenue. <clears throat> and based on the information that was submitted, um, we see that more than 50% of the property will generate um, revenue and be a, debt, uh, a benefit to the state as a whole. So then we also have to look at our comp plan and how it fits in. Today our major street plan identifies um, Catron as a principal arterial, 16 Mount Rushmore Road as a principal arterial. Les Hollers, that's already constructed with uh, Black Hills Energy, that's already constructed to the property line. And then we also have a collector road, Promise Road, 
extends right there. That's already constructed. And with the new proposal, we will be seeing the uh, construction of Promise Road from the existing facility right here south to connect to Les Hollers. Then we also look at our uh, comprehensive plan and how does that fit in? Um, are the land uses consistent? We have one piece of property that's identified as residential. This in here is identified as uh, mixed use commercial. And then this area in here is office commercial. And all of the proposed facilities and new improvements are consistent with this comp plan. And then we also have to look at the zoning. So here really is the proposed district. And we have commercial. General Ag is the holding zone for the residential property and then office commercial for um, the piece on the north. We also look at the existing uses. Everything in the district on uh, the east side of the residential lot is all vacant. And so here's a couple pictures. This was taken um, in 2016 looking north. You can still see some remnants of uh, the cart ranch. We know that there's a nice big structure right over here on this side. This is looking north from uh, just south of Black Hills Energy Building. And then we have uh, the view a couple days ago where there is nothing on this site. They've already graded, done a lot of grading on the site. This is the uh, intersection looking to the south, south east. We have the new hospital facility here. We have the new hotel in this location. This is the existing uh, orthopedic facility. And then this is the master plan that was submitted before the um, TIF discussions occurred. The applicant has indicated that they can use the, uh, construct a portion of a new road, connect to the existing uh, road bed, and then um, connect to the frontage road. One of the things that city and uh, city staff and DOT staff have um, encouraged the developer to do is to get rid of uh, the frontage road because it, you know over time it's been shown that frontage roads don't really operate as efficiently as they thought they were going to in the 1960s. And so based on our major street plan, we've encouraged them to come through with a connection similar to that. And you can see on this um, plan, we've got a large office building. We've got several other uh, retail facilities. Here's a, uh, you can't really see that one in there. There's a restaurant, there's a convenience store, and another potential restaurant over here on the west side. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is the proposed map of the public improvements. Like I had indicated, here's Promise Road coming down through here. There will be a new connection um, from Promise Road to the east to uh, provide access to those commercial facilities and then the large um, building that they'd identified for office. So um, there is some, in addition to Promise Road, there's some uh, realignment issues that they're going to have to address. Um, and extend the construction of Promise Road to the south. There is a drainage pipe that's going to be connected from uh, both sides of Promise Road. And then there's some minor um, drainage or grading for the roadbed. Um, but other than that, we are going to get the realignment of Promise Road. There are indications that this frontage road that exists will um, be removed. And of course, they'll remove the existing roads there as well. So we also look at the um, project costs and how those match up with uh, the uh, proposed other development. We have Promise Road, the construction of Promise Road, the uh, realignment of the intersection of Promise Road and uh, Golden Eagle. Um, there's potentially some adjustments that they're going to have to make to the signal depending on um, the width of that signal and, and where the intersection on the north side occurs. So the capital cost for um, this proposed TIF is uh, just a little over $2.8 million. There are some professional fees associated with that, some contingencies that they can use in case any of these costs go over, the estimated um, interest rate at 6%, and then the total uh, TIF cost for this particular project plan. We do also have identified that there's a $20,000 administrative fee that's assessed at year five as soon as those funds are available. That's standard in our TIF policy. 
One of the things that we need to consider with this particular location is um, our tax increment district number 70 was approved in 2008. The proposal today is in this corner, which means that any overlapping TIF, um, any revenues generated from that TIF will go to pay for TID 70 first before any funds are allocated to the new TIF that is before you today. Just as uh, uh, some background information for you, there's also a tax increment district for Black Hills Corp, and there's also a tax increment district for Buffalo Crossing. And here is that map with the overlapping districts. It's kind of confusing, but the black and white one is TID 70. Here we have 76, which is Buffalo Crossing, and then Black Hills Corp is 77, and here is the new proposal uh, that is before you today. We also look at um, how all of those revenues that are generated from each of those districts funnels in and when uh, each of the districts are gonna pay off and how those revenues um, come forward. The only concern that we uh, always have with a TIF district is how accurate are those revenue projections? And it really depends on when the construction occurs. So if for some reason those revenue projections aren't um, actually, uh, they don't come forward like they were submitted, there's always a concern on, well, who's gonna pay for that if it doesn't pay out like it's supposed to? The developers are always on the hook for those funds and, and that's part of the developer's agreement. So if for some reason they don't come forward with the development like they'd indicated and it doesn't pay off like it's supposed to and there's a balance at the end of the 20 years, they still get to pay for that balance. So there is no impact to any uh, tax uh, uh, property owner. So again, here is the proposed uh, public improvements. Again, we get this intersection redone, the construction of this road, and then the drainage pipe and some, and all of the utilities associated with this particular road. So with that, um, the tax increment committee did recommend approval. Here are the dates of the uh, districts. There is one district that um, is potentially gonna have issues with the repayment, and that is the Black Hills Energy uh, District. But one of the things that I wanted to also show you before we finish is we've been looking at this intersection since uh, 2004. And the current proposal from 2016 is a single point interchange. Um, and that's similar to what we have at Haynes and East North Street and uh, Iowa 90. One of the things that uh, we're looking at is the issue with this frontage road is the taper on this intersection on the Northeast quadrant or Northwest quadrant, excuse me, uh, doesn't align with the proposed intersection uh, design. So that's another reason that the state and the city have encouraged um, the, the property owner to come forward with their application and that we would support that. But with that, again, the uh, tax increment committee did recommend approval in September. Um, we put the project plan together for you. I did find a couple errors in there that I would like to correct. So. With that, staff does recommend um, approval of the creating the district and the project plan with a couple minor corrections. Any questions? I don't have any lights up, Patsy. Um, I'll go. Um, so is the, the frontage road is definitely going to be removed as a part of this agreement or it like, might yeah. be? Nope, um, up to about here. That's our understanding that um, this will be removed so that they can, uh, DOT actually has uh, in progress um, an agreement um, with a developer to address some of the issues. I know that there's some right of way that they're gonna have to donate and you know, I, I don't know what the details are of that agreement, but okay. um, through conversations with the developer, he has indicated that they are removing that frontage road. Okay. Uh, Vince. Yes, I, I also have some questions about the frontage <coughs> road, but I'm not sure based on your answer just now whether or not it's gonna be answered. But uh, you know, I understand that you said that this was back in the 60s, this was a great idea, but uh, what, what is the primary problem with it is what I'm trying to grasp here. There's, uh, it, it creates issues. Let me go back to the. Okay. 
this picture here, it, it creates issues with stacking. You can't actually get onto that little intersection. Well, let, oh, I don't have I don't have a picture. I do right here. Right in here, we have a stop sign at this location, and what happens is you can't get from this stop sign to this stop sign to the other side of the road in an efficient manner. Um, it's it's a safety issue. Okay. Other questions or comments from the commission? Mike? Do they, does the DOT have a estimated time for that intersection or they're still tie in? They're still working on the environmental assessment for um, the two final design proposals. Um, this is one of them. The other one is a continuous flow intersection. It's a brand new design for this area. Um, it's about half the cost of the single point interchange, so they're looking at um, the impacts to the properties to you know, what may occur before that final design comes forward. But once that design's done, it's about an eight-year process before they can actually get it programmed, designed, and into the um, current year step. Well, part of the problem that they have on this intersection, they're already having uh, accidents and, and, and problems with that intersection. We're developing that. Do we cause, before that intersection goes in, do we cause a lot of problems by developing this this way? No, I, I don't believe so because um, a, a couple of the items that will come forward, you know, as soon as the warrants are met, and I know the warrants are met um, at this location, will be a signal to help with the timing at this intersection. There's also a signal that will be coming forward um, when the warrants are met at that intersection to help uh, direct the traffic and in, in space them out a little better. And the city has come forward with a project to put an additional lane in Catherine Boulevard. We're also looking at uh, future improvements to Sheridan Lake Road. When that comes forward, that study comes forward and is uh, complete. So there's some other things that we're looking at to address some of the issues currently there. And that's why DOT is, has been studying this for a while. To when does that additional lane go in? Because that would be a, an enhancement, I think. I do not have that answer. But I know that, you know, the, the roadbed's already there, you know, because when we originally constructed that um, connection, they planned for the extension. So it, it, in my opinion, based on what I've heard from the engineers, it's, it's a minimal, um, it, it's not going to take nearly as much to get that constructed as a brand new road. I think this is a great thing to do over here, but I, I just have concerns with the traffic and, and what we it feels like we might be putting the cart before the horse a little bit. It's uh, a busy intersection, and uh, it, we need to really address it. it and, and DOT has made um, substantial changes um, to address any of the issues, and, and, and I believe what they've done so far has reduced some of those um, safety issues that they've seen. Okay. Vicki? Oh, I'm sorry. You finished, Mike? Vicki? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Patsy, could you put the slide up that shows the... Um, lot layout that will work uh, just as a reminder to the Planning Commission that here a couple meetings ago you recommended approval of a preliminary subdivision plan that in essence would remove that service load al along Mount Rushmore Road and would create promise road in the coldest sec street as shown uh, within the TIF documents so the uh, applicant has committed to that configuration the state reviewed that as well and indicated their concurrence with the street networking. So they have taken step one to ensure the city that that is the, the uh, fashion that this property will be developed. Okay, thank you. I think we got a speaker request from Mr. Shaffey, and I don't have any other lights up, but. Good morning. My name is Hanny Shaffey with Dream Design, and we're involved in the uh, property. We're part of the uh, development team. Uh, you know, Mike asked uh, great questions. You know, there are a lot of efforts, you know, with the city, our team, and the state that has been going on for almost, actually almost a year. 
uh, to really uh, make sure that this development will fit with the future plans that all the governmental agencies uh, are planning for that area and still maintain minimum impact on the existing traffic conditions. Uh, some of the improvements that are, uh, as Patsy mentioned, you know, the traffic signal at the intersection of Promise Road and Catherine Boulevard is actually installed and it's a flashing light right now. <coughs> Currently we are in the design uh, phase of the traffic signal on Healing Way and Catherine Boulevard and hopefully before the summer of next year it will be installed. The DOT is changing some of the turning movements for the traffic that is going west by restriping and adding another lane, I believe, uh, which will enhance the, uh, some of the uh, turning movements. The traffic signals will slow down the traffic. Uh, this uh, connection down here, which is, you know, connector road, which connects the service road to Catherine Boulevard, will be closed as soon as probably even February or this year, if not sooner and uh, which will enhance some of the safety. So those are some of the uh, current safety measures that are taken right away at this time. Uh, as far as Catherine Boulevard, I believe the city has hired a consultant and most of the design is complete for widening Catherine Boulevard. As far as construction, I don't really know if it is this coming year or the year after that. So I hope that addresses some of the concerns that you have. If you have any other questions, I will be available. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments, questions on this? Galen made the motion to approve the resolution to create the Promise Road Tax Increment District and approve the associated project plan. Vince seconded that motion. Excuse me. Yeah, with, Patsy. with the minor corrections in the project plan that I found? Yes. Okay, thank you. Does that work for you as well, Vince? Yes. Okay. Both the uh, motion maker and uh, second agreed to that. Any further discussion on the motion on the floor? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion, oh, sorry, no, is all those not in favor. The motion carries with Karen's abstention. Item number six, discussion items. That's seven. I do have one for okay. you. So uh, at our last meeting, a request might, was made by uh, Commissioner John Hur that we are providing you with paper packets until we get new electronic equipment. And we have diligently been meeting with IT staff and amongst ourselves uh, to secure tablets and hopefully that will be done for your next meeting. And uh, after that meeting, um, we'll probably sit down and go through any questions you have about them. And we'll be here a little early, so those of you who uh, prefer to use a city-issued tablet versus your own, um, we'll be here t if you have questions about how to maneuver through it. So just as a reminder, hopefully by next meeting we'll have those. Thank you. Thank you. Carla, I think you're up. Good morning. Um, this is my time to talk to you about the constitutional and kind of legal parameters for what you do. <laughs> We have some new members on the um, Planning Commission and Zoning Board, and I'm glad you, you all are here. Um, and hopefully this will be uh, helpful for people who have heard it before and also helpful for people who this is new information. Um, the Due Process Clause really comes from our state constitution as well as the federal constitution that says no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Um, that kind of covers it from capital punishment for serious crimes all the way down to zoning board decisions. So that's a broad category, that's a broad um, provision in our Bill of Rights um, that kind of covers a lot of ground, uh, including the work that you all do. Um, so when does due process apply? 
Uh, we talk mostly about due process applying in quasi-judicial proceedings. Um, so those are proceedings that kind of, that also kind of covers a lot of ground. But um, for your purposes, quasi-judicial proceedings um, are present when decisions are appealed straight to court instead of uh, when you're acting as a recommending body. In your case, um, maybe some of you realize this or maybe some of you don't, the state law really treats, treats zoning decision or zoning board of adjustment decisions kind of more seriously than planning commission decisions, even though um, from my perspective, usually you're talking about like some sort of minor change to a setback. But um, state law says when you're serving as the zoning board, that's certainly quasi-judicial because that's not appealable to council. If you have a problem with, um, or if somebody has a problem with what the zoning board does, like in the situation this morning, uh, they have to take that to circuit court. And it's um, the work that you do in that area is, is given a lot of deference. Um, in contrast with planning commission, most of the controversial things you might do are appealed to council, and council is the final dis decision maker. That doesn't mean that due process and the things we talk about today don't matter in the context of the planning commission. It might mean legally they don't matter as much, but um, um, they're still relevant to every decision that you make because it goes to whether or not you're a fair and impartial tribunal and you're giving um, uh, fairness to everybody who comes in front of you. So it's important, it's just legally it's maybe a little bit different. Um, but quasi-judicial proceedings are when decisions are appealed straight to court and they're also just decisions that are related to property rights where you're taking in information uh, hearing from people who have different opinions about the decision and making a judgment just based on what you're hearing. So that would be planning commission decisions even if you're not happening to be the final decision maker. Um, since, I, <coughs> since I'm up here, um, there's a few other kind of not due process but um, other legal parameters for the sort of work you do. Um, that I think probably Vicki talks about with you, but I'm just gonna highlight a little bit. I told you that state law treats the zoning board differently. Um, it says that uh, for somebody to get a variance through the zoning board, it needs to be a, an affirmative vote of two thirds of the members. Um, so there's nine members um, and two alternates, but nine m members of the zoning board. So there needs to be six votes to grant a variance in the zoning board. Um, situation. That's because the zoning board applies to every piece of property in the city. If you're going to give somebody a special variance to opt out of one or more of those provisions, state law says you need a higher burden, you, or they need to have a higher vote. Um, so that means if there's only six people who are here, like today was a good example, there were eight people who were here, eight people who were voting, they would still need six people to vote in favor of it. Um, it's not two-thirds of the people who are here, it's two-thirds of the total board, which is nine, so that two-thirds is six. Um, in your motion to grant a variance, you need to include the basis for granting the deviation from the zoning code. Galen did that today in his motion. Um, that's an important part of, of motions when we're talking about granting a variance. If you deny a variance, that's fine. You can deny them all day long, and you don't have to have an affirmative, you don't have to have six members, you don't have to give a reason. That's the default, but if you do make an adjustment outside of that to grant the variance, then you need to do it. Um, to say why, some of the reasons that justify giving a variance are special circumstances that exist, strict application of the zoning code would deprive the owner of any reasonable use of the land. The staff reports do a good job of using that language that's in state law in our ordinance to give you help to grant those variances if you're inclined to do so. Just to talk a little bit about reasonable use of the land, um, our last lawsuit that was um, brought in the context of zoning board variance, it was before the zoning board and the planning commission merged. So I don't think any of you all were on the zoning board. At the, no, I know you weren't. Um, but there was an application to, um, to grant some variances to allow a duplex on what was essentially a single family lot. So there was a variance to a couple setbacks, Fletcher worked on this, as did I. Um, and there was a variance to, because you need a larger lot for a duplex instead of for a single family home. So, um, so they went to the, the applicant went to the zoning board, um, asked for these variances to allow duplex. Um, the zoning board gave it to them. 
um, gave them the three variances, two or three. And um, the neighbor who was unhappy about it sued. And we litigated that in circuit court in front of Judge Kaczynski. Eventually, he decided that there was reasonable use of the land. It was a single family home. And the variances that would have allowed a duplex on that um, were, they went too far. They were outside of um, the parameters of the zoning board's discretion. And so that was reversed. And now today, there's a single family home on a lot. So those are the kind of things that, um, you know, not everybody sues on a variance, even if they're unhappy about it. But that's kind of how the zoning board works. Um, additional legal parameters for your decisions, please follow the ordinances. In that case, the zone or the judge who was reviewing it said they didn't, the zoning board didn't follow the ordinances because there was reasonable use of the land um, without the variances. Um, and this is one that we talked about a little bit um, in the past. Um, there's some clear case law from the Supreme Court of South Dakota that you can't rely on vague reservations of neighbors or even of yourself to support your decision. A lot of times people come in front of the zoning board and talk about, or in front of the planning commission and talk about property values, that this is going to decrease my property values. Well, that may, might be the case, but um, uh, just vague statements or just allegations of that without any sort of demonstration of that or uh, it's not legal proof, but facts that would support that allegation, um, just relying on that in order to make the decision is not enough. You need something more of a factual basis for that. Um, I'm not saying that none of the decisions you make affect pro property values. They certainly do. But, um, but you need some sort of other facts to support that, that that would happen instead of just people assuming that that's going to be the case. Oh. All right, so what does due process require? There's kind of two groups of people who worry about due process. One is staff, and two are you all. Um, so as far as staff, um, due process requires notice to people who might be interested in a, um, an application. That's notice by mail, notice by sign, notice in the newspaper. We take care of all of that, or Andrea does. Um, staff are also concerned about people's right to admit relevant information or evidence to you. That's putting together the agenda, getting public comment attached to the agenda. Um, staff also are charged with um, protecting people's right to know the evidence or claims against their position. So if there's public comment that comes out in really against an application, that the applicant has that information and can respond. So in terms of um, things that the commission is protecting, people's right to be heard in front of the board. Um, some people think that's an unlimited right. Our Supreme Court has said, in a, in a case about a county board of adjustment, if you limit people to five minutes, that's fine. Um, it's not an unlimited right to be heard. Uh, people in the community will disagree with me about that, but, um, but it is a right to be heard on, on the issues. Um, again, it's a right to know the evidence or claims against one's position. That's kind of a right that's protected by both staff and the commission. Um, and then, you know, people are entitled to impartial decision makers and a right to a fair decision based on the information presented at the hearing. All right, so who is an impartial decision maker? Since that's what you all are supposed to be, how do we um, talk about that? It's one who is disinterested in the outcome, or said another way, one whose interest in the outcome is the same as a regular citizen. So if you have a particular interest in, a, in the outcome that makes you different from um, you know, the person on the street um, who's just concerned about our community and how it's developing, uh, you, might, you might be um, not an impartial decision maker. Um, and it's a person who is free from actual bias or predisposition to the outcome, and also somebody who appears to be fair and impartial. Um, courts reviewing this, and honestly the public reviewing it, cares if you have an actual bias or if it looks like you have a bias. Sometimes that's sufficient enough because um, it undermines the um, appearance of fairness in front of, for the people who come before you. Um, you're presumed to be objective. So the default is you all, uh, you're disinterested, you're fair and impartial, but, um, and you're capable of just being a fair person to judge the controversies before you. Um, it has to, there has to be some sort of evidence that shows that, to, that casts that, that default into, into doubt. And again, we look to actual fairness as well as the appearance of fairness. 
So conflicts of interest are one area where people can be biased or predisposed to a particular outcome. I think this, I've given this slide to, uh, this, this slide looks the same, and I've probably said this about 10 times since I've worked here, but it's important. So conflicts of interest, there's kind of two areas of conflict of interest. The first is financial, and that's direct. If you directly benefit from something that comes before you, if you have property that's in a TIF district that's before you, if you have, um, if you're the applicant or you work, work for the consultant on a particular application, uh, that's a direct financial interest in what happens and that's a, that's a clear conflict of interest. Um, you can also have an indirect financial interest um, if your employer would benefit or be harmed. If you have a close family member, if you're a part of an organization that would uh, be harmed. A few years ago, we had an application from, um, the, from Arrowhead Country Club. That, I don't know if that was financial or personal, but um, four of the members of the Planning Commission were members of the Country Club, and they recused themselves from voting on that, on that item. Um, I think it was, yeah, it was for a cell tower, probably the, um, the Country Club would have benefited by, by a lease. So there was a financial interest of an organization that they were a member of. Uh, so that's an indirect financial interest. Um, then there's personal interests. Um, there's direct, you benefit in a non-financial way, um, or you would be harmed in a non-financial way. Uh, an example would be, I live across from an undeveloped parcel of land. Um, if, if, it, if I were on the Planning Commission um, and an application came in to develop that land, I might not be person or financially I might not have an interest in that land, but I would certainly be affected by its development. So, and people would have that information, and I could be seen as not being uh, impartial, especially if I was against the development. So, a personal interest is some sort of benefit that you get. Um, this can also be indirect. I read a case last night that was about um, a school board firing a boys' basketball coach in Woonsocket, um, where the Super Intel, where somebody on the board was really interested in how their son was playing on the basketball team. And that was part of the basis for firing. The coach was related to the level of play that the son was getting. Um, that was, they have some of the same rules that you do. And, uh, and that was found to be a personal interest that was indirect, but was disqualifying for, for that person. Um, that cast into, uh, I, anyway, it undermined the decision to fire the coach. So that's an indirect personal interest that can be very strong, apparently, but um, also can, can challenge your objectivity. Um, and hopefully this shows you that whether or not a conflict of interest exists, it's, a hard, it's hard for me to give you any clear rules other than if you have a direct financial interest in it, um, you should recuse yourself. Um, but you can imagine a hundred different scenarios where it's unclear if a conflict of interest exists. So it, we really do look at the facts of each situation. Um, in 2016, the city adopted a conflict of interest policy. I'll email that to you, all of you in the next few days um, because you need to be aware of it. If you've been on the board before, you've seen it. But um, it talks about how when you, you or an immediate family member has a conflict of interest that disqualifies you from participating, um, it gives you some rules to follow. Again, if something disqualifies you is, is a fact by fact situation, you have to kind of look at the whole picture. Um, but if you've decided that, that you should be disqualified from voting, um, the policy says you disclose the conflict prior to the agenda item being heard, or probably at the start of when the agenda item is heard. You recuse yourself from voting, and if you have anything to say on it, you do it from down here, not from up there. Um, and in terms of an immediate family member, our conflict policy says that uh, a spouse, a child, a parent, a grandchild, a grandparent, or somebody who you claim on your taxes as a dependent. Um, so that's the, that's the, what the policy says. Clearly, if you have a niece that you're very close with, um, maybe that would be a connection that you would want to recuse yourself from. But again, that's one of those factual circumstances that we have to look at. So if you, have, if you need help in deciding if you have a conflict of interest um, that might kind of cast 
cast things into um, just give you a question if you need to recuse yourself or not, you can sure talk to, I'm offering Eric <laughs> or any of the other uh, leadership here. You could talk to me, you could talk to Vicki uh, or Ken, you know, that could, we could help you vet through that. Um, you know, the safest course of action is always to recuse yourself, but I don't have that advice for you because, um, you know, legally that's, that would make things certainly easier for me, but I don't think that that's, um, I, 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 that's not my recommendation at all. I think that we need to look at these on a case-by-case -case basis and make a determination and um, if there's a disqualifying interest or not. Okay, um, one part of due process is having a fair hearing. So people can come into here to the Planning Commission or the Zoning Board meeting and know all of the things that you've looked at, all of the things that you've considered, um, hear from people about what, what kind of things you're hearing from and what people are saying to you, and um, that the decision that you make is based on all of that public information. Well, one challenge to that is what we call ex parte communications, which really are communications that are fr outside of the hearing. When you're in a situation where people are talking about something that will come before you on the planning commission, where one person calls you up and says, hey, I hear that this rezone is on the agenda, here's what I think about it, um, you know, those kind of conversations outside of our official proceedings are what we're talking about. And this includes all types of communication from a Facebook message to a two hour long conversation. Uh, we're really talking about any kind of level of communication. And it really, those kind of communications that happen outside of the hearing really undermine and endanger due process that we've been talking about. So the concerns are the appearance of fairness. If there's a situation where you're seen by an applicant talking to somebody who's a vocal opponent, um, there's an appearance of fairness that would, that would be challenged. Um, to, in, the, in the context of judicial cases, which I'm familiar with, and um, but it's when ex parte communications are when one attorney goes to the judge without letting the other attorney know. And when I first started out in law practice, I went out to lunch at Shooters with my colleague. And we walked in and we were seated right next to the judge on one of our cases and the other side's attorney. And they were having lunch together. And that's, you know, judges can have friends and they can go out to lunch with their colleagues. But that's the thing that I always think about when I think about um, these ex parte communications. I'm sure they weren't talking about their case, our case. I'm sure nothing improper was happening. But I don't know if my client would have felt the same way if my client was having lunch with us. So um, there's, an, in, there's a, an appearance of fairness that's challenged with these ex parte communications. And then there's also actual fairness. You know, if somebody talks your ear off about an application, if you're in a meeting where a new business comes up that is heavily discussed as to how they're going to affect the business community, um, it, it might affect your actual fairness and impartiality. Um, and again, we want to have a complete public hearing here. So if um, there are people who are seeking you out and want to talk to you about this, if there's a discussion that you need to like step away from, um, th that should be happening at this meeting or at least in terms of public comment that's offered prior to the hearing. So the, again, these communications really endanger people's due process rights. Uh, state law has a couple things to say here that gives you some protection. You can rely on your own experience and background in making decisions. You can receive and consider relevant information from any source. That's what state law says. I, I would say please don't use ex parte communications to get that relevant information. Um, you can receive input from the public directly or indirectly. Um, and that doesn't necessarily require you to recuse yourself. But it also says if you rely on anything that you hear outside or anything that you see, you need to disclose that at the meeting because people need to have the opportunity to hear, hear from you if it's something that's not on the record and, um, and be able to respond. Um, if, you're, if there's a particularly controversial zoning or uh, rezone decision and you found it to be essential that you went to the site and saw and saw that this wouldn't really affect the neighboring properties, um, disclose that evidence at the, disclose that to the meeting and, and give people the opportunity to respond. Um, 
if you fail, state law says if you don't make this disclosure and it was fundamental to your decision, they could just disqualify your vote. And, you know, even though state law kind of gives you a little bit more, dis, you know, judgment to take in information from any sort of source you have, I would say please, um, the due process side of it um, uh, would lead me to tell you, please don't listen to other conversations. Don't seek out your own information. Get it from um, at the public hearing, get it from staff in advance of the hearing and, and have people have the chance to respond. So if somebody comes to you or if you're in a situation where people start talking about a particular item before you, you know, take yourself out of the situation. Say, you know, I can't tell you anything. This is pending. Please come to the meeting. Um, disclose the communication at the meeting if it occurs and recuse yourself if you feel you need to. There's a few state court cases that have looked at the disclosure as being um, fundamental and not totally undermining the decision. Um, there's a case that I talked about the last time I talked about this with you all where um, somebody, um, somebody worked at a, involved in alcohol license and in the council member was a waitress at a competing bar. Uh, restaurant bar and um, she was getting pressure from her employer to say no to the alcohol license because it was going to be bad for his business um, she got a letter from him saying pretty much please don't vote to to give my competitor this alcohol license and she kept that to herself and then when ultimately the lawsuit occurred um, it came out that these press that this communication had occurred um, that's not great I mean if you have a conversation even if it's two hours long before you realize, oh, I shouldn't really be talking about this, disclose it at the meeting and say what happened. Um, there's other cases that have said that just disclosing that might be enough to say, okay, you put it out there, it's out in the open, people can respond to it, and we're not gonna, if, if a court is looking at it, um, totally throw out the whole vote. Um, so that disclosure piece is pretty important. Um, so I said I'm not you shouldn't recuse yourself every time there's a possible allegation against you but here's some hopefully this is my attempt to give you some <laughs> actual concrete things um, you should recuse yourself when a conflict of interest exists that is sufficient enough to um, you know cast your impartiality into doubt you should recuse yourself when your interest is different from the interest of the uh, members of the general public that's the you know, development of the property across the street from your house. Your interest is more particular to your own situation rather than the general public. Um, recusal would be appropriate. You should recuse yourself when actual bias or prejudgment exists, um, when there's an unacceptable risk of actual bias. That goes to um, how things look to the, to the regular person. You know, if, if your sister is in front of the planning commission asking for something, people are going to assume that you have an unacceptable risk. You might not have spoken with your sister in 20 years and you can't stand her. Maybe that's biased the other way. But that's not going to be, um, th that's going to be perceived by the public regardless of your actual relationship. So um, that's what we're talking about with an unacceptable risk. And, you know, if a reasonable person would look at the situation and conclude that there's this um, prejudgment, then recusal would probably be appropriate. Um, in the case of the Arrowhead Country Club people, members who recused themselves, I wasn't, I didn't tell anybody to recuse themselves. I thought, you know, there's a lot of members of Arrowhead. If you're not involved with this decision, um, you know, it's not necessarily true that you need to recuse yourself. They all did anyway, and I thought that was totally appropriate. So, um, you know, that's probably a good example of how these are really uh, dependent upon the facts of the situation. So that's a lot to throw at you. Um, uh, are there any questions or comments? Thank you, Carla. Anybody have anything to add, throw back at her? Yeah. So, Carla, you talked about uh, going to a site um, and, and how that's, uh, that could be sort of ex parte in a sense? Well, kind of, a, and not necessarily communications, but it's gathering information outside of the hearing, yeah. Okay. So is that something that you would always uh, 
say is, is it a bad idea or is there a way to go about it if you want to visit a site to make it so that it's still, um, you know, acceptable? I don't, I'm not going to tell you that you shouldn't um, go past sites because I do that. I think that that's, it's, we live in not a large town. It's going to happen. Um, I think if it's, if you make a decision, if you go out to that site and you, and that becomes a really important piece of why you're voting a certain way, I think that should be disclosed um, uh, because it's really a basis for your decision. So um, there are some cases, you know, I just read a case from Idaho where the Idaho State Court says, no, you shouldn't drive past it. If you need to go out there, it should be part of the public meeting. And that is certainly something that we can do. I think it's been done in the past, although it hasn't been done in the last five and a half years because that's how long I've been here. But if that's something that needs to occur, we can have that be part of the public meeting, um, you know, if it's really important to a particular site. But I'm not going to tell you to not drive past it. But again, if, it be, if it's really important to, um, to your decision, that would be something that I would disclose at the meeting. Okay. Thank you. Kim? Uh, it would be my opinion that ex parte uh, does not reach into the realm of driving past the site and looking at it. I would expect that that is uh, beneficial to your review, just as you would read the staff report. Going by the site and seeing the physicality of it uh, is important. Now, I'm not going to try to cast any uh, differences with legal opinion here, but I. Th uh, I've been of the opinion that it's, it's, it's necessary for uh, planning commission members to understand the site and it would be very beneficial for you to do that. Now if you stopped and talked to the uh, owner of the property, then certainly that uh, in my mind falls into the realm of ex parte and that should be disclosed. Uh, but the simple driving past and understanding how it looks and what's there, in my opinion, does not fall into ex parte. Thank you. Uh, Justin. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I guess I asked this to Vicki too when we met, and I guess I just, while we're having the conversation, um, throw it out. But So I work for Skull Construction um, as a project manager. And so <clears throat> a lot of the developments and things that come up, you know, at, as it stands today, we have no ties to, but potentially could. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Hanny develops something and we get the project a year down the road when it happens. I guess I'm just throwing out, or what would your opinion be as it sits today as a vote? Because down the road, potentially I could be working on that project, but I don't know or have any indication, indication right now that I would be. So to me, it's not a conflict, but I can see it could be perceived as one six months down the road if for whatever reason it comes back up. So I guess what would be your opinion on that? Well, I think it's clear if you if it's a project that Skull already has a contract on, that's a conflict of interest. Um, I think it would really depend <coughs> on. Um, I'm not going to say that every potential project, since you work for Skull, every te technically everything that comes through here would be a potential project. Um, so I don't think that you know that's speculative potential is sufficient to you know take you out of the voting for majority of what happens. I think, um, you know, in terms of we're really looking at the appearance of fairness here. So if the day after um, you make a decision up there, there's a contract um, that might look bad if it's, you know, a year down the road, it's clearly not connected. So um, I don't, you know, I don't have a lot of hard and fast rules for you. I don't think, I mean, Andy Skull has been on the board, so he, and he voted on plenty of things. Right. So. Um, and, and same same happens with other people who are on, on the board. So I think you know purely speculative potential conflicts of interest don't rule you out at all. Okay. Um, if there's a lot closer of a um, connection between the decision and the contract, um, that could create some problems in terms of appearance. But um, sure, and I've talked to Andy about this to make sure you know kind of how he approached it. Now, what the difference is. He's much more in tune to maybe a potential project sure. than I am, so he may know today that he's talking to the developer where I don't, I'm not aware of that, but the potential could happen that next week, the contract sign, I just didn't have any clues. So I, I'm just throwing it out there, I guess, 
for everybody to be aware, and, and I'll do a case by case, and, and as a, if I have any indication of anything, I'll abstain from the <coughs> vote, but I guess I just wanted to ask the question to make sure that from your standpoint, it seemed reasonable that I vote on things that maybe down the road I'm involved with. Well, you know, that approach sounds fine that, to me. That approach sounds fine to me. Yeah. Yeah, I got a question. Uh, you know, since we're, you mentioned Facebook, and we're, we're talking about Skull here, and, there, and the Internet in general, mm -hmm. we're talking about driving by. Uh, you can get a lot of information from the Internet, and there's, uh, this is uh, all this information that uh, we received prior to any kind of zoning request. Is that going to be relevant at all? Because at that point in time, how were we supposed to know that something was going to come up? Like in the case of Skull, any, any of these projects could eventually be theirs. Um, well, I'm not exactly sure. I guess I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. Well, this. let me ask. <laughs> what I'm saying is, is that, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, we have access to the Internet. There's a lot of information that we can gather on anything. Sure. So, uh, so are we talking what is, we, we obtain the information prior to, to any request being presented to the, to the commission? Oh, sure. So if you're just reading the newspaper and they're saying this is going to happen out here and then two months later you see something in... in uh, Better example. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't really have a problem with that at all. Uh, you know, when something specific comes in, you're going to look at what's in front of you. And, um, I mean, I don't think it... Um, I, what I'm what I'm concerned about is when there's a particular item on an agenda and you seek out extra information. Right. So outside of the realm of that, I I don't have any concerns about you being just a generally educated person. <laughs> and um, so, please don't consider this to be any uh, any comment on reading the newspaper. Okay. Yeah. A good question though. Oh, Mike. I think everybody that's on this board has probably involved in different organizations that have made them who they are. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the question comes up that some of these organizations are a little more uh, uh, out there. I mean, we, they, I, I'm involved in Scenic America, Scenic Rapid City. Oh, sure, sure. Billboards is a big thing, mm -hmm. all right? I've got opinions on some of the things that billboard companies should be doing. I've developed those over a time period. Uh, I would prefer not to be recused because of my opinions. Um, and so I guess similar to what was brought up with construction, it. it I'm assuming that we don't have to be recused just because we're on these organizations. I don't. I don't think so at all. Um, I think the the thing that I'm concerned about is if you have a conversation as part of this organization about something that is coming before you as a planning commissioner. If there's, we're talking about specifics. If you're part of a group that's talking about billboards and changes to the sign code in general, those kinds of things. Well. Maybe not changes to the sign code, but that, that's an ordinance, so that's a little bit different. But, um, you know, if you're just talking generally about signs, that's not something that is specific enough to raise some due process concerns. But if you're at a meeting of Scenic Rapid City or whatever the group is called, any kind of group, um, and a particular item comes up that, that you're going to be sitting on, I would ask you to step out of the room and say, you know, I can't, in order for me to vote and planning commission, I can't be a part of this conversation. Um, and just take yourself out of the situation because I think that's when we're talking about specifics is the line that crosses over from um, being part of the other group to being part of the planning commission and protecting your role there. I don't know if that gives you um, the, yeah, kind of. the guidance that you were asking for, but I mean, partly why you're up there is because you're interested in and involved in development in our community. And so if your otherwise outside um, involvement in the community is gonna take you out of voting in the majority of the time, then that's not what we want either. So I think um, when we're talking about specifics is when, when your red flags should could go up. Could go up. 
Yeah, I would echo that. I mean, I think there are guidelines to the selection of planning commissioners that suggest that they be involved in, mm -hmm. you know, the development world or be interested in the development world. And that, you know, gives better opinions to me, better comments to have people that, you know, may have to recuse themselves at times up mm -hmm. here. Uh, planning? Ken? Yeah, I just, I wanted to, to concur with what Carla mentioned. I think uh, a lot of it just really comes down to good judgment uh, as to what the particular situation, what are the specifics of that particular situation. We want you to be informed. We want you to be educated. We want you to be prepared uh, when you come forward to make your decision. But if you're getting extra information uh, from sources, from people that are specific to the item on the agenda, that's where you need to be careful. But to be informed and, and prepared, I think, is, is the best way to look at it. Karen? Yes, uh, I want to go back to the drive-by where you look at the property. Um, a lot of times when we see things that are given to us electronically and we try to understand where that property is and what it looks like, uh, the one that really comes to mind is the recent one that we had that was across from South Junior High, or not, that middle school. school. Mm -hmm. That school, <laughs> yes. Um, and it had to do with the height of that that structure, the the land that they were going to put the structures on top. And I looked at the 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 uh, paperwork and and electronic stuff that was given to me, and I couldn't understand the height until I drove by it. And I think a lot of the planning commission members felt the same way. And I know several of them did drive by it also. And we stated that at the meeting that we had driven by, and, and that's what it looked like. But until I saw it in person, even pictures aren't sometimes do it justice. But we don't see those pictures of the sites until we get here. And so sometimes that's hard to visualize where it is. And there's also been times where <laughs> I have no idea that, where that's located. And even, even a rapid map gives me a general idea, but until I drive by and see how close it is to the neighbor or whatever, it, mm -hmm. it makes a difference to me, and I've always felt that if, I don't drive by every one of them, but if there's something that I don't understand, I, I want to drive by and see it for myself. And, and so sometimes that, that does in, uh, influence my judgment, and, and I try to state that, that I've driven by, and this influenced my judgment because of that. But if, it, if I just drive by and say, okay, it's located there, then I don't say anything. Does that sound like the right thing to do? No, that sounds totally fine. Okay. Um, state law says if you're relying on something outside of the meeting, you should, you should mention it at the meeting. If it's not, if it's not surprising to you, if, if, if you just drive past and you're like, oh, okay, there it is, um, that's not something you would necessarily need to say at the meeting. But if it, you're, that example is a good one where it is important and it is relevant to your decision, and then that should be mentioned at the meeting. That's... Sounds like you handled it just right. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I was just going to say, I think uh, disclosure is, is the key word here, that if in doubt, just disclose what you found or what you saw, and then uh, that your disclosure may help you to determine whether or not you should recuse yourself. Um, but once again, I just, I would like to personally encourage drive-bys to sites before the meeting. I think it's a good idea, so I would encourage it. Thank you. Further questions or comments on this? I don't have any more lights up. Thank you for your questions. <laughs> well, thank you for the presentation, Carla. I appreciate it. I think that's our last bit of business then. Move to adjourn. Karen made the motion to adjourn. Rachel seconded the motion. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. Aye. aye.